Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm a tech philosopher, author, filmmaker, and the founder of Fempeak. On this podcast, I speak to some of the most brilliant minds of our time to help us navigate emerging technologies leading to a socioeconomic singularity. Our guest on today's podcast is Matthew Pines, a fellow at the Bitcoin Policy Institute specializing in national security. This was probably one of my most favorite conversations. We dove into some very deep and complex questions around Bitcoin and macroeconomic shifts, including the United Kingdom opening up to crypto assets. I can't wait for you to hear this fantastic episode. Before we start, let me tell you a few words about our sponsor for today's show. Meta Brew Society, founded by Holger Manwiller, is the first project that builds a utility bridge between NFTs and the metaverse and a legacy industry. Every Meta Brew Society NFT grants its holder unseen IRL utility of up to 300 cans of free craft beer per year in perpetuity, voting rights on the business decisions and access to exclusive brewing classes and beer tastings. I discovered you on uh, what Bitcoin did. I'm a big fan of uh, that podcast and, and what Peter is doing. So um, I really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, there were a lot of things that I felt like, you know, some of the things that you were talking about, I lived through a similar kind of experience in, in some respect um, because um, I was invited to uh, the US uh, in 2006 when I was uh, studying politics in um, St. Andrews University. I came from Iran uh, to the UK in 2005 and I studied politics here. And I was invited by the US State Department to visit the US for three weeks. And um, you know, I went to a, a lot of think tanks, a lot of, uh, we went to you know, places like from the American Enterprise Institute to Brookings Institute to Chicago Tribune. And I had to give a lot of kind of uh, presentations. At the time we were talking about transatlantic studies and in you know Iran and because it was after 9-11 and then you know they were thinking about bombing Iran and I was like no please don't do it it doesn't help that you can't bring democracy to mm-hmm. these companies <laughs> countries you know you can't you can't import uh, democracy or export democracy it doesn't work like that and it was very interesting hearing about the processes and the way you were talking about how uh, the government works and and how mm-hmm. these think tanks have an impact on their decision making. So yeah, so there's quite a lot to discuss. Uh, but let's start yeah. by giving a little bit of a background about what you're doing and you are and and uh, the research that you've done, which was excellent, by the way. I got Siri to read it for me because <laughs> <laughs> I'm very uh, you know auditory. You know, I, I I always have to have like audible version or anything. So I got Siri. I just selected and Siri read the whole thing. <laughs> Maybe I should put an audio version an audiobook for, for, with me narrating it we'll see um yeah well thanks for thanks for having me uh eager to kind of dig into to any topics um but yeah about my background so i'm i'm a management consultant uh which sort of means nothing uh and everything <laughs> depending on uh what type of work you're doing uh now i got started my my academic background was actually in physics and philosophy so i did that uh, as an undergrad i thought i was going to pursue the academic track kind of uh, realized that wasn't my cup of tea uh, stalled for time over over in London in your neck of the woods to do a master's in philosophy and public policy to try to bridge myself away from the kind of academic world, sort of more into sort of the real world. Came back to the US and again, kind of stalled for time doing a fellowship at the National Science Foundation where I sort of supported kind of grant making uh, from, the, from the federal government to uh, academics uh, in uh, sort of across the disciplines of economics, decision risk, management sciences, like game theory as well, sort of business school research. That was a sort of good two-year two year experience. Um, and then I thought, okay, what am I going to do now? And I had some buddies who were doing a startup uh, management consulting shop uh, in D.C. Uh, doing essentially exercises for the government, which is usually like war games. And I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, I don't really know what that means, but I'll, I'll, you know, I need a job. I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out. So that's where I got started. Uh, it was a very small company where they had like one or two contracts with the government, uh, but we grew dramatically sort of in the time that I was there. And you know, the nature of consulting is you sort of jump from project to project. And so every few years, I was able to kind of uh, sort of rewrite the nature of what I was doing um, and really sort of branch into a lot of different uh, areas along the way. But sort of the core thread of my professional career for the past 10 years has been trying to help the government and private sector understand their risks and understand how prepared they are for those risks and what they can do to sort of mitigate and sort of bolster their preparedness, which 
a sort of very abstract question. Uh, and there's very sort of qualitative and quantitative methodologies that we've sort of developed and applied over the years to answer that question for different clients. Uh, and on the government side, it's, you know, big ticket sort of national security, uh, you know, uh, topics, both sort of, you know, man-made threats, right, like terrorism, uh, you know, nation state uh, activities, as well as sort of natural hazards, earthquakes, you know, pandemics, uh, et cetera. So uh, I, I got kind of a, you know, front row seat to all the bad things that could potentially happen. <laughs> and so you climb this wall of worry until you reach, you know, a certain Zen acceptance, and then you, um, you just sort of, you know, uh, just realize that's just the way the world has always been. Um, so I got really, you know, uh, into a lot of different areas of the government, but also kind of understanding how to analyze these types of questions uh, and understand systems from that perspective. And then sort of my intellectual interest has been for a long time, you know, complex systems and how the society that we live in is vulnerable in various ways and sort of um, complex risks that uh, are hard to analyze, uh, but blow up, you know, time to time, uh, things that we see all, all, you know, in the financial world. Um, and, and so, you know, my entry into Bitcoin was really, you know, I think I have a similar story from other people where you, you first confront it and you're like, this is a scam. This is, you know, going to blow up. That was like my first encounter. I had, you know, a buddy who was, you know, into crypto, uh, you know, way back when I thought he was just going to, you know, just going to blow up in his face. Well, obviously he was right. I was wrong. Uh, and, and so it took a few bites at the apple. And so I got progressively more interested in it um, over, over the years. It was really 2020. That uh, kind of real that sort of precipitated a more formal recognition on my part of how this is going to become macroeconomically and geopolitically important. And so I was always interested in it. It's just like an, like uh, you know, a curiosity. Um, you know, and I had I had some investments in it, but I wasn't like, oh, this is going to be sort of world changing stuff. Uh, and it was really March 2020, COVID, and then the sort of social, political, economic response and consequences from that uh, that have since sort of cascaded. Uh, and, and now you know, we sort of we live in, in a new world. Um, that really fo you know, focused my attention on on it specifically, and tried to understand and apply uh, you know, uh, my methodologies and sort of my background uh, to it. And sort of I think that was the one you know, piece I could add. So I started contributing on Twitter, just sort of you know thoughts about Bitcoin, geopolitics, the macro sort of economic context, uh, and that's kind of where my int my interest is now. And then you know back a few months ago, uh, after sort of just you know lurking and tweeting on random stuff like that, uh, some folks approached me and said they wanted to put together this think tank to really bring thoughtful, rigorous, informed perspectives on Bitcoin to kind of the broader international uh, sort of policy community. And 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 I was sort of had this national security angle that that would sort of be complementary to to these other um, fellows they were bringing on that have expertise in energy, the environment, the economy. Uh, Etc. So they're really trying to put out, you know, informed research fact sheets, also kind of be a resource for journalists and policymakers. And so that's really where I took some sort of latent kind of inchoate ideas about Bitcoin's relationship to U.S. national security and put them down on paper uh, and try to think through in a little bit more systematic fashion, you know, what's the relationship between Bitcoin and U.S. national security interests, you know, beyond just like the headlines that are typically bandied about like Bitcoin and sanctions or, you know, drug money, et cetera. Like, okay. That's kind of an old storyline. What's the what's the, what's the future look like, and what's the serious sort of national security, geopolitical, macroeconomic considerations that need to be given to this thing? Um, and yeah, so I started with basically simple premise, which was you know not not in the paper, but sort of is is in keeping with the way that I've I've you know done this work for the government is there's a lot of scenarios the government will do serious analysis of that are very unlikely, but that have large consequences, right? So, you know, even if it has like a 1% chance of happening or less than that, even if they can't ascribe a probability necessarily to it, um, but if it were to happen, it would be uh, it would be strategically consequential or very significant. Um, it merits analysis, it merits serious um, investigation. Uh, and I felt like that wasn't happening with Bitcoin. Um, and, and if you just look at Bitcoin's trajectory, it's not. It's not a. Uh, it's not a. It's not an infinitesimal probability that Bitcoin could say reach parity with gold this decade, and if that were to happen, well, that would be you know strategically consequential for the world economy, for geopolitical uh, relations between East and West, et cetera, and it was just not being examined seriously. Uh, and so, if it has even a one percent chance of happening, um, well, for the U.S., that would be a significant event. It would be a significant event for the world, and so. It, it needs to be brought into that serious conversation, um, just like how we do, you know, serious scenario analysis and all sorts of things that, um, you know, aren't necessarily extremely likely, but but if they were to happen, would be would, would be consequential. And so that's how I, I viewed it, and that's why sort of what, what motivated me to sort of bring this 
into that conversation, sort of act as a bridge between kind of the legacy Bitcoin kind of crypto world um, and, you know, folks in DC who, you know, are just sort of, um, you know, heads down in their respective lanes and, and executing their particular responsibilities. Meanwhile, Bitcoin is just like creeping up on them. Uh, and, you know, one thing is that national security decision makers you try to avoid is strategic surprise. You don't want, you don't want to be surprised when things happen you didn't expect, even if they're good things, it's not great because you weren't prepared for them. You weren't even leveraged to potentially benefit from, from, from them. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of my, my take with Bitcoin is that it is, it is actually an actual security strategic advantage for us. Um, but if you're surprised by it, if you're not positioned appropriately for it, you can squander that opportunity uh, or you can react in a way that's self, self-defeating and kind of productive. And so that's kind of the, the motivation for getting involved with the think tank and helping to produce some of these reports. Um, but my professional career is still kind of in management consulting space. Um, and now I'm actually going to be move, moving on to a, a firm that specializes in sort of doing geopolitical risk, cybersecurity risk for, for multinationals where, you know, the trends that we see geo, uh, sort of geopolitically are starting to become increasingly fraught. So, yeah, that's kind of my, my angle, my lens uh, that I bring to, to Bitcoin. Everyone kind of brings their own, their own personal perspective to it, um, multifaceted in that way. Uh, so, yeah, I hope to kind of contribute at least my small part to it. That's amazing. No, that was that was really thorough. Also, um, can you tell us a little bit about the Bitcoin Policy Institute? Who's behind mm -hmm. it? Are the people who are behind it inherently for Bitcoin? I, I'm guessing, you know, and they want <laughs> the government to integrate it or um, what's their angle? Yes. So the Bitcoin policy was just started a few months ago as like a proof of concept. Um, uh, essentially, you know, some 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 kids really 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 uh you know forward looking kind of hard charging kids are really sort of the ones who sort of started it it's like their brainchild is like they looked around and they thought there's a lot of bitcoin twitter conversation there's a lot of people writing you know about bitcoin but kind of in bitcoin only kind of media right bitcoin magazine or sort of people have their own articles their own websites their own blogs um but there's not as much serious uh and there's some um crypto uh, like lobbying groups and advocacy groups uh, that are doing good work in DC, but are much broader, like just about sort of crypto overall. And that's, a, and there's a lot in there. Um, there's, you know, crypto covers quite, quite a large territory. And so there wasn't really anything in there that was sort of Bitcoin specific that, that was helping to sort of act as a objective source of information uh, resources for kind of the policy and like larger kind of informed uh, conversation about Bitcoin specifically. So they're like, all right, well, let's just sort of start this thing and like recruit like folks like me who have some sort of niche area of interest on Bitcoin specifically and, uh, and sort of bring them in and just ask if they want to contribute, you know, essentially to help write op-eds or help produce these sorts of long form research reports. Uh, and so if you look at a website, we have a number of kind of our, 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 uh, our senior advisors and like the fellows. Uh, and so those are the folks that are, are contributing. And I won't speak for, for all of them. We're all sort of independent kind of contributors to this larger larger project. Um, but I think we're all Bitcoiners at heart. <laughs> and so that's why we got involved is to sort of make the United States a safe place for Bitcoin and sort of as our larger objective and to make sure that, you know, um, you know, US uh, is able to kind of uh, seize the advantages of Bitcoin um, and ensure that it's as successful as, as it can possibly be uh, in our country. So that's, I think, the, the top line mission. We don't have um, like a particular lobbying, uh, like, uh, like, you know, like focus, like we're not, you know, focused too much on like reviewing legislation and like, you know, getting certain special favors into, it's more like a, a think tank. So like the Brookings of Bitcoin, right? Like what is, what is like a research report that we can produce that can be cited by folks in government, by folks on Capitol Hill, that's authoritative and rigorous. And that, you know, doesn't, doesn't, um, it's not like hyperbolic and saying, you know, Bitcoin is gonna, you know, destroy the state. And, you know, it's sort of uh, hyper, hyper Bitcoinization is, 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 is coming tomorrow. Um, uh, it's, it's about essentially, well, what are the serious issues here, trying to separate fact from fiction. Uh, and so, yeah, that's where we kind of got started was just producing some of those research reports. Uh, and it's kind of as a proof of concept. And now we have an open fundraising uh, uh, like portal so people can donate, um, you know, it's sort of a low cost uh, activity uh, to date just to kind of uh, bootstrap it. Uh, and so I think from now it's about getting some fundraising, bringing, you know, people who want to support it can support it. Uh, and so that's about how, how it can scale uh, going forward. I think it's poised for success. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it started just as like a, like a proof of concept project and it seems to have gotten some traction just in the past past, uh, past few months and so uh, it looks like it's it's poised for success 
as uh, as we you know head into this um, coming year. Uh, amazing. I'm hoping that you've given Michael Saylor a call <laughs> because if you're uh, fundraising. <laughs> I, th I think I think there's been a lot of people who've been contacted. Um, I think so. So the Bitcoin conference last week or two weeks ago uh, was a sort of a, it's coming out party to a certain extent. So you know a lot of our fellows were speaking on panels. I was speaking on a panel. Uh, so there's a lot of you know conversation about this new thing and and how folks can can sort of potentially support it. So um, I, you know I'm, I'm fingers crossed that there's some uh, you know uh, you know support that could be coming uh, out of that. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're open to anyone who wants to support it and uh, wants to see, you know, uh, kind of rigorous informed messages uh, and, and analysis on Bitcoin kind of get out there. Yeah, no, that's great. And hopefully they will hear and this podcast too. Uh, you know, we are working very much on institutional adoption uh, through our company. Uh, we're women led uh, and focused more on B2B and, you know, bringing mm -hmm. in more companies into the space, um, you know, to the Web3 space in general. And of course, Bitcoin, uh, you know, is the granddaddy of all. So, <laughs> so all of that stuff is, is quite important. Well, I've made some notes here as you were talking and there are are a couple of things uh, that um, I can see the, the connection between and I want to discuss. So one is, uh, you mentioned game theory and complexity. You know, I also been super interested in complexity theory. Uh, I studied transatlantic studies uh, and political philosophy. Um, mm. And in the transatlantic studies part, um, one of the things that we discussed quite a lot and, and worked on a lot was the relationship between uh, US and the UK um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, the special relationship and, and then, you know, with with Europe in general, but especially US and UK. And I will come to the, the relationship between that and game theory in a second. But first question is, I don't know if you're aware, I'm, I'm guessing you're aware that the UK has announced that we are going to become the crypto asset, asset hub of Europe. And they haven't given much uh, information. This came out about 10 days ago. So we were all very excited. We we're like, okay, this is all very interesting. And there's also <laughs> going to be a Royal Mint NFT, you know, uh, coming <laughs> up at the end of summer some, sometime. So, uh, or, or it might be uh, beginning of summer, I'm not sure. So in general, for the government, for the government of the UK to make that announcement, I can see a few possible game theoretic reasons for that. I would say the number one reason I can think of and the timing of it, the timing of it was literally a few days after uh, European Union tried to um, pass a um, the regulations around uh, proof of work being banned in mm -hmm. uh, Europe, which didn't go through, but it was quite close. And in general, there's been a sense of um, closeness towards crypto and Bitcoin proof of work, you know, in the European Union. So uh, the UK, literally a few days after that, came out and and released that. From a game theoretic perspective, I can see uh, why they're they've done that. So uh, it's <laughs> my uh, conjecture, and, and you can tell me whether you agree with that. But essentially, after Brexit, the UK government got quite a lot of backlash after Brexit because it was like a lot of people didn't realize how bad Brexit was going to be for us economically. Mm -hmm. So one, once it became clear why um, Brexit was not a good deal for us, there's been uh, quite a lot of controversy around whether this was a good decision you know now what does it mean for us how, how is it going to be mitigated you know all of the things that we've lost mm -hmm. all the risks and uh, I think the UK now sees an opportunity to show that the fact that we are out of the European Union is actually to our benefit because we can decide for ourselves whether we want to for example in this case the other thing is that going back to my transatlantic studies i think the uk would never make that announcement without having a heads up from the us government that they are also going in that direction. Again, this is my conjecture. So I'd love to hear your views on those two things. Yeah, that's that's a really, I think, insightful perspective. I hadn't connected those particular dots, but it does make sense. And I think in the context of what you're seeing now come out of like DC on digital assets and what you see come out of like Her Majesty's Treasury and the check, you know, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, well, I can't even pronounce that <laughs> Exchequer. Um, are, are consilient moves um, that all point in a certain direction. Now, I think under the under the hood, there probably might be a lot of very specific kind of nuances and legal kind of maneuvering over exactly 
the regulatory regime, how that's how that's negotiated in each res respective jurisdiction. Um, and there'll be probably contentious fights on those topics in you know, both countries and around the world. But I think what you're seeing broadly is, is, a, is, a, is a coherent trend that's very positive towards digital assets. For example, the executive order that the White House uh, released um, you know, just a month and a half ago, roughly now, um, was surprisingly positive on digital assets overall relative to where people thought it could be um, and pretty much said, you know, this is happening, this is here, this is not going away, this is going to be a major economic, social, and potentially political force, uh, and could be, uh, you know, a tool for innovation, for economic inclusion, um, and it's something that policymakers uh, and treasury officials, you know, in sort of the, to your point, like the transatlantic alliance and sort of the overall G7 system need to get their arms around. Um, and, and I think they're, they're cautious and they're wary. I think there are certain folks in the institutional structure that are threatened by by the emergence of these types of technologies, others that see it as a as a, as a certain advantage and a, and a tool to be uh, wielded, um, uh, you know, to their benefit. And so that's I think that's the battle that you're seeing. Some of it's in the open, some of it's behind the scenes. But I think those moves, the executive order, uh, what what the what, what Her Majesty's Treasury did, I think show where the balance uh, is is starting to, to to favor sort of more pro. Um, Pro crypto, pro Bitcoin policies in general. Um, that doesn't mean they're like going to become Bitcoin maximalists overnight and adopt it as like a treasury reserve asset, right? So I think people need to be cautious about uh, jumping too far to the to the end of like, oh, this means you know we're going to you know hyper hyper Bitcoinization. But it does, I think, very um, indicative data points about uh, you know that that reduce the the level of I say uh, risk that you would otherwise assign to the probability of say like an outright government ban, right? Um, and I think that that is the thing that I think has changed a lot just in the past two years that I've seen. It's just the probability of those types of extreme government actions have been like almost eliminated. Um, and then we're more fighting in the do domain of just like technocratic, like which regulatory you know agency is going to have dominance over certain parts of the industry, and how are they going to define self-hosted wallets in a way that maybe goes through the travel rule or not? And and these things are all are all very substantive, critical issues and there are avenues for the government to exert to try to contain it and try to control it as much as they can and try to channel it into the sort of lanes that they can you know direct it um, and that's I think where the battle is they realize that they can't they can't stop it they can't uh, crush it they can't ban it because uh, someone else will will just take it um, so what they're trying to do is negotiate with it right trying to accommodate the legacy institutional systems the regulatory framework in a way, that tries to balance, like what politics is, is balancing competing interests. Um, and so that's, I think, a positive trend. Um, and yeah, to your point, Europe is, as I think, on the other side of that balance. Um, I think for, for historically um, sensible reasons from their perspective, right? I mean, I like to put myself in everyone's shoes just to try to think about how they would reason about these things. And you think about the European Union and the Euro as a monetary um, union is a political project fundamentally, and it's brand new. And it's not as, I'd say, um, durable or as sort of doesn't have the historical weight that like the pound sterling or the dollar has. So I think they're much more acutely um, conscious of potential threats uh, in the monetary domain and the economic domain to something that could undermine sort of the fragile coherence of the Eurasian Monetary Union. Um, and, you know, when it comes to things like proof of work, uh, I mean, we won't have to go down the rabbit hole of, of how proof of work is actually beneficial for incentivizing re renewables, but Europe, as we're seeing right now with the Ukraine crisis, is acutely vulnerable uh, to and, and constrained when it comes to energy. So they don't have surplus energy; <laughs> they have they have a deficit of energy. Uh, and, and what whereas the rest of the world, if you think about you know the West, like U.S. has this, you know, amazing surplus of energy, especially surplus of, of renewables in places like Texas, Australia, massive surpluses of energy. Um, there's lots of parts of the world that have surplus of energy where, where, where proof of work mining um, sort of is a natural sponge to go. But in Europe, you know, most parts of Europe are energy constrained. And so they're going to be much more conscious of anything that constrained, you know, uh, it just starts to become rival. In most places of the world, Bitcoin mining is, is, is non-rival. Uh, but in parts of Europe, uh, it may be considered rival. So I can sort of understand that both from the uh, the energy side, but also from the economic side. Like, you know, they, they want to keep the euro as a dominant means of exchange and unit of account. Uh, and that sort of a, is the way they've been able to keep, you know, what would otherwise be fractious political disunity from, from, from decaying. And they have historical memory that 
that um, is very strong, but it makes them want to keep keep any threats to that consensus um, out. So I think in the end, like they'll they'll realize that this is actually not a threat to them um, long term. But in the meantime, they've got so much. They're dealing with so many uh, challenges to to the stability of their their monetary order, the economic system, the debts that they have. Um, that they they're, they're they're struggling, and this is where instead they're going to move towards more like a CBDC wrapped. Uh, you've already heard, you know, pretty strong inc- you know, indications on that from, you know, the European Central Bank and Bank of the National Settlements, the sort of ECB um, uh, movement toward a CBDC. Uh, you know, and the not so subtle reason for that is, you know, Europe, uh, like Japan and like the U.S., um, although Europe is pretty far along. Uh, in terms of their overall um, debt to GDP ratio is they need essentially financial repression. They need to run in, uh, inflation hot over a certain period of time while keeping interest rates low, which means they do, do enforce you know, losses on bondholders. Uh, and that's especially problematic for Europe where they have these target two imbalances between you know, the, you know, the German you know, kind of bloc and the Southern bloc. And we've seen that blow up and almost threaten the stability of the union in, in the past. And so it, a, a CBDC is a, a mechanism they could, they could try to implement that would help them sort of spread the pain around in a way that might be more politically um, uh, uh, sort of tenable um, and sort of impose negative real rights, um, which they're already doing in, in deposits <laughs> to a certain extent, but they can't really go much further. Um, and that's, that's essentially the, the geopolitical, geoeconomic and macroeconomic challenge that they face and why they're probably not gonna be long-term, or at least in the medium term, very pro-crypto uh, relative to you know, UK, that sort of, I would say the other half of, of the G7, um, I'd say the more oceanic side of, of the G7. So like Japan, South Korea, Australia, um, New Zealand, um, Canada, the US, I think are gonna be more, more, more pro-Bitcoin, more pro-crypto, at least in the near term. Yeah, definitely. I'm just um, making notes here and thinking about, you know, which of these are more priority to go into because the CB- <laughs> CBDCs are like something that we could talk about forever. Uh, yeah. they're not, it's not particularly my uh, favorite topic, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's important for people to understand what they are. These are uh, central bank digital currencies and mm-hmm. these are not cryptocurrencies they are not the mm-hmm. kind of crypto that uh, you know that people know uh, and those who are into it love um so we will see if we can if there's a time to come back to that but um mm-hmm. just looking at here uh, a few things i'm guessing you've read ray dalio's recent book right principles yeah, the, for the principles yeah. for a changing world yep yeah basically what he talks about in this is obviously as you know that is about the rise of china and mm-hmm. you know the fact that uh, the us is uh, towards its end of its empire and then China is rising. One thing that he doesn't mention in in the book, uh, which really um, surprises me, is uh, the impact of technology. He doesn't Mm -hmm. really talk about any decentralization. If we are talking about potentially, you know, the US becoming, going towards the end of its empire, it it doesn't necessarily mean that the alternative is another uh, nation state. We have now this decentralization movement. And I think that there are a few things that can be a hindrance for the type of decentralization that we are Mm -hmm. talking about here to uh, take hold. And, and become really dominant to a point that it becomes more successful than the nation state and the corporate state. So one of those obviously is regulations and, and we are seeing that things are, are opening up a little bit. But tech um, in China and the uh, government in China, they are essentially one. They are basically one and the same. It's, it's, it's mm-hmm. quite united in that sense. Whereas in the West, we have three different movements. We have got uh, the the governance, and then we have got the big tech corporations, like, you know, the Facebooks and Amazons and Googles. Um, And then we have this new decentralization thing that is, is still in its infancy in many ways. So when we look at the value of you know, the big tech, the majority of the S&P 500 and, you know, all, all those big mm-hmm. corporations, they, they still hold the majority of the value. On the other hand, we've got, you know, the likes of Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and uh, all these other um, decentralized movements kind of still being in the two to three uh, trillion mark, you know, so very, mm-hmm. very early stages. Um, and then, of course, we have got the government. So going back to that game theory, the governments mm-hmm. in the West are in a very difficult uh, position because they mm-hmm. have, uh, in some ways, they have got the, 
the big tech against them um, because mm -hmm. there's already been that fight for power going on. And now there is this decentralization movement, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and this is what you get in a democracy. And so mm -hmm. the democracy is evolving. But mm -hmm. for people who are within, you know, who are inside it and who are like, you know, those rep, because we are in a representative democracy right now mm -hmm. and we are going from representative democracy to a more direct type of democracy thanks mm -hmm. to decentralization. Um, but but this is putting us in a difficult position because it's, it's actually quite dangerous in some ways. And it really does worry me because in China, we have got this united foe in, in some ways, you know, this mm -hmm. adversary. And then in the West, we have got this fractionalized power. So um, on the one hand, we want democracy and we want decentralization. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, my worry is that this decentralization movement, it's not yet powerful enough to counteract what's happening in China. Um, and on the other hand, uh, you know, if we don't allow it to grow, we risk regressing in our democracy. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> yes, uh, those I think are the, going to be the, the defining uh, questions of the decade and probably the, the decades to come is just how, how those forces of kind of geopolitics and transnational technology formation around around these novel forms of of participation uh, which is really what these sorts of technologies enable are going to are going to start to collide um, and which political systems can adapt and they're sort of um, evolve to uh, sort of a new form of democratic participation while sustaining legitimacy but also still being able to project the type of geopolitical power um, that that allows them to sort of um, challenge potentially more emerging uh, axis of authoritarianism. Um, so yeah, so the way I kind of view these questions, it's, it's very difficult because there's a lot of variables. You're not quite sure which one to, to sort of pin in order to, to sort of adjust these other ones to try to think about the future. And the further you go into the future, the more uncertain it gets. And we're in a moment right now of sort of heightened geopolitical volatility where, you know, lots of things bad things can happen that could affect kind of the future trajectory in a lot of different ways. Um, so I try to zoom out and just try to set, you know, set crypto and Bitcoin aside, just trying to get the lay land of where the geopolitical sort of monetary dynamic could be heading and then try to overlay kind of these emerging technologies on top of it and see how that might affect the dynamic. And so just to kind of get the status quo, you know, one of the, you know, looking at history, right? This is the lesson of history, you know, for first order, what constrains geopolitics is geography. The fact that the United States is a continental island and the fact that Eurasia is this you know, massive landmass is what dictates the evolution of human politics. And so it dictates the form of states that, that, that evolve on those land masses and the types of um, uh, kind of warfare that then is, is, is and technology that, that's incentivized. So you have, you know, the Eurasian landmass, which is the heartland of the world system, you know, the old Mackinder theory, right? Who controls kind of the heartland, controls the Eurasian periphery, controls the world island, controls the world. Um, and so you have kind of this natural dynamic that's played out in history. It's somewhat of a simplifying trope between kind of land powers, Eurasia, and maritime powers, kind of great Oceania, right? You know, the transatlantic system that we formed with, you know, Western Europe, the US and then the island nations in the South Pacific now kind of manifest that kind of two poles of the geopolitical order uh, that, that just are fundamentally constrained by the nature of, the, of their geography. And so that's the situation. Now, if you look at the 20th century, what the, you know, the, the key dynamic that played out was really that confrontation between land-based Eurasian superpower and a maritime-based oceanic superpower and, and the associated different political systems that developed in those, right? Maritime commerce, democracy, old Athenian, you know, kind of legacy. And then land-based, centralized, imperial systems, autocratic, right? Not to, it's again, very simplifying trope, but it has a certain gestalt to explain overall kind of long-term dynamics. So we're, you know, that doesn't, history doesn't, history doesn't, doesn't just disappear, right? We, 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 like we live in it. Um, so that's the like high level constraint that, that everyone is, is operating in over, over a longer, uh, longer time period. In the modern era, uh, you know, what we've seen post World War II was U.S. dominating the global system, setting up the dollar as a reserve currency status, establishing this recycling system so that everyone who had to accumulate dollars in order to engage in global trade had to recycle those dollars into our debt, U.S. Treasury securities. And that was basically meant been the global system. Uh, with the petrodollar, it sort of you know, reached a new gear and now all oil sales had to be dominated in dollars, recycled into our debts in exchange for military protection. So there's a synergy that we set up between a dollar system, a rules-based Western-led international order, secured by Western US-led military power and our nuclear umbrella 
and it was focused on containing you know, the, the dominant land power, Russia. And the key geopolitical victory of the 20th century was peeling China off of Russia in the 70s when Nixon went to, to, to China and split Eurasia. And that fundamentally weakened you know, what would otherwise be a dominant Eurasian power bloc and allowed the, the West essentially to win the, the Cold War. And then Russia collapsed in the 90s while, while China was weak but rising. And we thought we could remake those two key Eurasian power Eurasian powers in our image. And so we had, you know, the sort of sock shock therapy in Russia, new program of neoliberalization that backfired and turned them into a mafia state because everything was privatized and captured by, by the city of who took over and Putin is now, you know, the head of that system. So then Russia, you know, was able to kind of re re-energize themselves, re-strengthen in the last 20 years. And China, we thought we could bring into the World Trade Organization again. You know, the promise of capitalism would lead to democracy and eventually would sort of break this, the Communist Party's grip on power. It didn't work out, to, uh, to, didn't work out that way. And so then China took over, uh, you know, instead, uh, we brought them into that recycling system, but turbocharged it now as outsourcing all of our domestic manufacturing or labor to them to do the, to do the labor arbitrage, great for profits, great for Wall Street. Um, but now, you know, China, you know, built, was able to build up its, its industrial capacity um, to take a lot of Western technology, really jumpstart their their whole economic system and become a peer competitor to the US across all domains, economic domains, military, geopolitical. Their main, their main pivot point in 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 this brings us to the private day was in 2013, where they stopped net accumulating US Treasury securities and instead relent the dollars that they that they get from our trades, uh, our trade deficit with them um, and lend them around the world through a program of dollar denominated overseas lending called the Belt Road Initiative. So building massive uh, rail and pipeline infrastructure across Eurasia buying and reinvesting in strategic assets like ports and, and rails and land and, and, and also spreading political influence around, around the Eurasian periphery through the Middle East, all the OPEC countries into Africa, even South America. And so that's, that's where you bring brings us to today is, okay, the geopolitical confrontation between East and West is really an unprecedented dynamic where you have two rising land, two rising powers in Eurasia in a, in a quote unquote, no limit strategic partnership that she and Putin announced in, in, at the Beijing Olympics just before Russia launched the invasion of Ukraine. So I think if you look at the Eurasia war, the, the Ukrainian war in the context of this, of this strategic confrontation that's now unfolding between the Eurasian powers, this sort of axis of, of authoritarians and the Western system. And the economic dynamic there is Russia is the largest you know, commodity exporter on the planet. Uh, it's not the same thing as sanctioning Iran. Uh, you're sanctioning you know, a critical supplier of, of what the world needs to run itself. And, and that, that's, that's not an easy thing. That's like cutting off your leg. Um, and you need to tie a tourniquet on and you're not gonna be able to run you know, the 100 yard dash as quickly as you could. Um, and not only that, but so, so Russia being sort of the dominant um, has things in sort of the marginal control over the pricing of such commodities and energy and food. China, as being sort of the warehouse of the world, has the dominant power over the production of finished goods and supply chains. We're all waiting for the ships to come from Shanghai over to the port of Los Angeles uh, to, to get the stuff that we buy. Um, that's how our consumer economy functions. And so we control in the West, instead, we control the marginal price of credit, dollars, which used to be the dominant power over those other two, because we can essentially price all of those things in dollars they all have all those settlements in that trade finance system had to be cleared through the dollar system and we could sanction it, we could control it, we could essentially enforce um, kind of, you know, a quasi imperial tribute system on the world through that. But now that that side of the world is saying, oh, we're going to we want to break that system. We don't want to price our goods in, in that uh, depreciating uh, uh, you know, asset anymore. We want um, we want to move to a different system. And so that's the confrontation you're seeing right now is, is a test of who's going to rewrite the rules of the global uh, economic and geopolitical order. And typically in, in the past, and this is where, where Redalio's book comes in, is you know, when you have those rising powers confronting status quo powers, typically they resolve in war. And that's what we're really, really trying to avoid here is can we manage through like a, you know, this, this, this conflict without you know, an outbreak of global war? And so that's where, to your question, is like, I sort of would then, like, I, we need to like isolate assumptions, like assuming we don't have a world war, right? Assuming we don't get into a full scale, you know, uh, World War Three, which, you know, kind of all bets are off in that scenario. Assume we sort of manage through more like proxy wars, like, 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 like Ukraine wars, like some other proxy wars that could develop and hybrid wars, geopolitical competition, cyber economic, all that stuff, but we don't blow each other up. Then how does this dynamic play out with this sort of emerging decentralized technology? Um, because you have then on top of this 
state structure, which has sort of been the dominant historical logic of how geopolitics evolved, we've had in the past few decades has been multinational companies form. Like, and they rode the wave of globalization that was predicated on that sort of state system being stable. So, you know, you had like, you could go into China and do investment. You could go into Russia and do investment. You could set up, you know, operations if you're a global multinational company in all of those countries, like only a handful of countries, maybe you could like, you, you had to avoid, but they were not economically significant. What I think is being seen now is that that is going to that is stalled and threatens to reverse sort of globalization and those most multinational companies now having to essentially pick a side <laughs> what they, they never had to pick a side right it was just we're just we're just uh we are just mobile capital we go to where the highest return is and if that's in beijing if that's in moscow or if that's in london it's just it's just wherever we can get the highest return and now when you have geopolitical tensions dialed up you know, each of those states are going to start to squeeze respective pools of capital and force them to choose. And that's where the, the, the you know, the power dynamic of state power on capital and, and principally to your point, a lot of that capital is technology capital. It's these, it's these, it's these, you know, transnational multinational corporations that are essentially technology um, companies. Um, and both our companies in China, as well as Chinese companies in the U S and that's where you see these friction points uh, uh, emerging. Um, and that's the that's like the simple question, which is like, okay, quote unquote, which of these you know technology companies that are still centralized technology companies and how those you know will essentially become to a certain extent, um, you know the, the state will compel them to 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 do their bidding ultimately, right? When push comes to shove, you know when when the chips are down, you know, you know, Microsoft will go with the U.S. and Alibaba will go with China. And then, you know, whatever the state needs in a moment of crisis or even just, you know, just because, uh, you know, they will do. And, you know, we kind of know that um, behind, behind the scenes. But now it's, you know, it's going to become more and more obvious that, like, there are going to need to be more sta state-led industrial policy, national champions established to try to compete. And I think that's, to your point, like a worrying trend of, well, we can't in the West out totalitarianize you know, our, our system against China, like the CBDC, for example, right? Like we're not going to create a surveillance system that's going to match the Chinese surveillance system. We don't want to. It's going to like our, our people will revolt. Like it just can't be implemented here. Um, and so then how do we compete? Well, we have to compete on like a, a ground in which like that aligns with our values. And that's kind of where I went with my paper on Bitcoin, which is here's a manifestation of a decentralized technology that embodies sort of core American values and that is actually helping to um, you know provide you know developing market uh, uh, emerging market developing country populations with the you know a store of value and a technology to, to transact peer to peer that it potentially could mitigate uh, being ensnared in like uh, a digital yuan that could be you know uh, enforced on them through some sort of top-down corrupt governance. Um, and so if you're trying to counter China's ambitions over, you know, across the world to spread the sort of what you could call authoritarianism as a service. So offering political support, money, as well as you know, uh, you know, sort of Huawei technology, cell phones, as well as the digital currency infrastructure. It's all interoperable with China, setting up bilateral trade, bringing them in sort of a, a, a sort of a, a technology and economic and political alignment with China. Uh, longer term, that is against the U.S. interests um, and probably against the interests of the people in those countries who are going to be now subject to you know the same sort of authoritarian system. That people in China are, are subject to, um, but you know, is now essentially just like a subscription model for, for for dictators around the world to opt into. And so, what is our what is our alternative? What is our what is our you know what are we going to counter that? Um, and I don't think a, a U.S. CBDC or a better U.S. surveillance coin is going to do it. Um, and if you look at those countries around the world, what they're adopting organically are things like dollar-based stable coins, like Bitcoin. They're This is what they this is what they're 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 developing and adopting now. As like a natural counter to that Chinese ambition. So to your point about you know where this could go, how the U.S. and the Western system could try to foster that while not controlling it, while still maintaining a delicate balance of it can't be controlled, but we, you know it can. It's like it's net good for for our population. There has to be. I get it. It's it's more like when you're in a moment of crisis, you want to control things. You want to say, all right, marshal our state resources, our full instruments of national power to win the war. And if there's a war, like a full scale war, well, all bets are off and they're going to do what it takes and it's going to be net destructive for, for humanity. And that'll be a terrible situation. So I hope we can avoid that. Um, but if we just sort of muddle through the sort of proxy war, hybrid war, you know, world where, 
you know, they try to, you know, the, the Eurasian system tries to break the dollar space treasury system and move to some sort of commodity gold backed hybrid regional sort of uh, a trade system. Um, it's just like a messier world. Then there's this opening for the sort of both like a non-aligned movement to emerge that's premised on sort of these decentralized technologies, but it could be um, fostered by a Western led coalition that basically says, yeah, these are net good and are, you know, um, essentially fighting the fight that we can't and won't fight against sort of Chinese digital totalitarianism. So there's a lot in there, um, but that's how I think these, the dynamic is going to play out, uh, both at the sort of macro geopolitical, state to state, multinational level. And then you're going to see this emerging Bitcoin digital ecosystem uh, sort of start to come into that dynamic and, and whether we can use it to our advantage is going to be the question. No, yeah, definitely. I could talk to you forever. We don't. Uh, <laughs> we are we're reaching closer to the end of our mark. So uh, I have so many notes here. I'm just trying to think which one to go with. And I guess okay. So to maybe the last uh, kind of remark that we can um, address is personally. You know, I call myself a tech philosopher. You know, I look at mm -hmm. uh, I study philosophy, philosophy of technology and politics, and um, the way that. I see technology. I think technology is a life form in itself. I think, you know, everything that we are talking about in terms of geopolitical stuff and macroeconomics, we are talking about them from the viewpoint of us as humans. But I think mm -hmm. if we go back and, and look at early days of the universe, you know, when, when there was a big bang, <laughs> since then, you know, I've always asked myself this question, what is life, right? And there's mm. this amazing book called What is Life by Erwin Schrodinger, where he talks about the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, all these um, uh, different quanta, you know, like the, the mm -hmm. particles, they are uh, all kind of randomly kind of percolate in space. And then uh, sometimes they come together in a random way and then they create these clusters and then these clusters try to overcome entropy. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so everything is going towards entropy and then these uh, clusters, they create uh, a form of life essentially, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's what life is. And then intelligent life is when that life becomes aware of the fact that it's doing this it tries to overcome entropy in a better way so it's all about organization and that is technology so in my mm -hmm. book you know from a philosophical point of view i think what technology is is the process of organization mm -hmm. you know so, so it's, it's a set of we call it a set of tools and techniques that uh help us um, you know slow down entropy basically right mm -hmm. so 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 that process is technology and technology therefore i think has a life of its own it's a it's a life form so we everything that we talk about in uh, macroeconomic um terms for me ultimately goes down to technology and where technology is going and and for technology mm -hmm. i believe that it's in the interest of the universe and this trend of organization, self-organization for us to become more and more decentralized. Therefore, it would make sense that from a technological perspective, uh, if we think of technology as a life form in itself, that it's such a powerful movement. Uh, self-organization is one of the fundamental forces of life and, and order. Um, and uh, decentralization is like a way that this can be done in a much more efficient way way so it would mm -hmm. make sense that the decentralization is the default and that's where we are going if that's the case then mm -hmm. when we were talking about this game theory between china mm -hmm. and the and and the big tech and the western governments and this little baby decentralization that is growing mm -hmm. i i would say that the decentralization is going to win you know because because it's it's the default nature of technology mm -hmm. um and it i don't know if what you think of that but if that's yeah. the case then it uh, it would make sense for anybody watching this trend to try and not stop it and not slow it down because you are essentially going against the nature of organization yeah those are profound thoughts uh i would i would tend to agree with with, with that um and it's just saying yes you're you're completely right technology is sort of the substrate defining precondition for civilization itself and if you look at what human civilization has been able to do in reaching higher forms of organization and sophistication and complexity has been entirely dependent on our technology breakthroughs um and 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 you can see the sort of nature of the technology that gets developed has the feedback loop on the political systems that are then made possible and the forms of violent conflict that can then be made possible i think what you saw in the 20th century was 
uh, you know, a manifestation of that, sort of the development of certain technologies, right, in the previous hundred years, the internal combustion engine, the telegraph wire, um, explosives, um, nuclear weapons, all led to sort of the ability to project power globally and the construction of vertically integrated massive nation state structures, which in the Westphalian system were really never possible, right? Just like kings and his castle and some loose affiliations of tribes that could all be played against each other. Now you could construct massive state structures um, and have them wield power over millions of people, diverse tribes, histories, cultures, all into one collective mass and have those masses be, be crashed into each other in, in massive spasms of violence, which were immensely destructive. And I think we're, we live in sort of the the aftermath of that still, right? What that led to, to, to win and fight World War II, you had to construct these massive state structures. You had to create the modern bureaucracy that still exists in most of the, most of the world. And we have, you know, we have you know, departments, we have you know, big bureaucracies, we have a certain system of planning and, and resource allocation. And, and you know, all of that has basically been, been running for, for 70, uh, 80 years. Um, and really what the internet birthed and now modern decentralized, you know, uh, sort of computational consensus systems like Bitcoin um, is a new form of social co sort of coordination that wasn't possible before. And I think we're still not quite sure what the second and third order consequences are, are that going to be. And you're right, there is a kind of socio-technical sort of dynamic, which is, is it the humans driving that technology or is it the technology driving the humans? <laughs> and, and to a certain extent, it just depends on like, well, what's the story you want to tell? Cool They're evolving. Both, you know, Cool yeah. evolving. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, we are essentially um, agents in a larger system that has emergent dynamics that's co that's complex and self-ordering, and 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 is going to change in ways that we can't predict. Uh, and that's I think the part that's exciting, but also very uncertain about how the future of technology is going to going to play out uh, at the geopolitical level, because these legacy st structures, you know, are inherently brittle in a lot of parts of the world. Um, and the question is, how well do those legacy structures adapt and evolve to, you know, sort of transition as as new technologies enable new forms of social coordination and new forms of governance at like a local peer to peer, you know, kind of organic level without breaking everything that already exists. That's the key question. Can we can we evolve and mature as a society with these new technologies uh, in a in a continuous way or do things break? And then had to be rebuilt. And ideally, we don't want to live through one of those break disorder reordering periods. We want to have like a nice transition. We want we want policymakers to sort of understand how these systems are going to evolve and could create tensions and frictions that could blow things up if they're not well uh, managed and, and, and anticipated and recognized. Um, or, or you just put your head in the sand and then things happen around you and then there's a crisis. I think that's the key point is it is, it is going in that direction. Um, and you can't predict technology. You can't predict where these sort of complex emerging dynamics are going to take, take you know, people. Uh, and, and so you just have to maintain flexibility and also just keep, keep an eye on what aspects of your legacy systems are, are going to break. And that's where like my, my professional background is all about like, Okay, you have these massive complex systems that we rely on, right? We still have a we have a power grid, we have a water system, we have we have the internet, um, and some of these have decentralized aspects in terms of their networks. Some of them are quasi self healing. Some of them are not. Some of them have failure points that can cascade and take everything down. And so that's where like decentralization is. Like for me, it's like a high level concept, but you need to cash it out in terms of a specific like network structure. And understand well, where are the failure points in that system? Are there is there a single point of failure that could take everything else down that maybe I wasn't I wasn't um, anticipating? And you're probably never going to know when or if there are you've eliminated them all. So you have to sort of act on the precautionary principle and build systems that aren't vulnerable to that single point of failure. So not like a just in time supply chain or a grid that if one transformer goes down, the whole state goes down. Like you have to think about building in resilience. And that, that's often you know, where you need to build from the bottom up. You need to have sort of the iterative testing that takes place in that decentralized manner to build these systems that aren't gonna be these, um, that aren't vulnerable to these shocks that, that can take things down. So that's, that's the point of fragility we're living in right now is we have, these, we have this global structure, a lot of these uh, institutions and networks of trade and geopolitical relations that are, that are fragile. And the question is that these emerging decentralized technologies, yes, they have a lot of promise in the future, but in that transition, things can get messy um, and things can break that, 
you know, what we hope we, we don't have to deal with the consequences yeah. of, but, but yeah, I'm, overall, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that, that they'll, that they'll mature and they're growing faster than I was expecting. So I think net the trend is positive. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I'm hoping that the governments um, get it sooner than later that, um, you know, trying to stop this thing it, or, or slow it down is not beneficial to anybody, you know, including themselves, uh, you know, in the long run. Okay, no, this has been a super, super interesting uh, conversation. And I know we will queue for an hour. Uh, you know, this was one of the greatest conversations I've had. So I really enjoyed it. Uh, where, where can people find you and what's next for you? Sure. So I guess first you can go to uh, uh, btcpolicy.org. That's the think tank website. Read the um, report. Yes. Yeah, you can re- read that report. Uh, we're going to have probably some other reports coming out um, and other materials in, in the coming months. Uh, they'll be posted. You can go to my Twitter, just at Matthew underscore Pines. Um, and then I also am working on a longer form essay for, for Bitcoin Magazine. Um, I don't exactly know what might come out, maybe in May or June uh, in the print edition. That's going to be on Bitcoin and geopolitics and trying to sort of do a more systematic deep dive on where we are geopolitically and, and where, where Bitcoin might be playing a role. Um, so yeah, be on the lookout for that. Um, has to be edited. It's a little, it's a little long right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, that's what, what I got cooking up. I'm not sure if I'll have time for a book. Uh, I've got, I've, I've got two, two daughters, uh, five and two, so oh. they keep me occupied. <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe, 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 maybe maybe shortly if I if I think there's enough content for a full book that'll be a side project. No, that would be great. So um, our platform, we are women led and we are inclusive to everybody. And what we really want to do is to get more women in the lead. So we are mm. building for the generation of like your daughter. Um, that's, awesome. That's what we are building for. Well, um, yeah, m- maybe in a few years uh, she'll be contributing. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Now we have your contact. You know as new things happen you know we might call on you again to come in and, and uh, shed light on whatever it is that you're working on yeah yeah i would love to thanks for having me this was fun i hope you enjoyed this conversation with matthew pines be sure to follow him on twitter and keep an eye out for his upcoming reports on bitcoin and digital assets if you enjoy this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it on Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star rating and write a review. The full reviews are also available on my YouTube channel.